still a few loading so I'm gonna very 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 slowly start um, I have been introducing our speakers for our surface summer school um, but tonight I am going to share the platform or actually give the platform completely to Mark Lothenberg, uh, my partner in crime. Um, Mark has been hiding behind the scenes but has been instrumental in uh, putting the whole Surface Summer School together. Uh, we thought of the idea together and uh, he has been incredibly generous and been sharing his amazing staff, Nate and Michael and everyone else with us. Uh, so I want to give the platform to Mark Lothenberg of Surface Magazine. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, not sure I'll do as good as you do because you're a natural, but, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, thank you for joining us for Surface Summer School at Penn. My name is Mark Lothenberg. I'm the CEO of Surface. Uh, <clears throat> inspired by Penn students' recent involvement in the 3D printing of a thousand face shields for Penn Medicine's six hospital health system and recognizing the unique challenges faced by students seeking an internship or employment this summer, Wink and I conceived a month long challenge in which students create a prefabricated COVID-19 testing structure that will enable quick and easy assembly on site. The summer school is intended to express optimism in, the <clears throat> in this challenging time through the exploration of exciting new directions in manufacturing, highlighting Surface's belief that creative design and emerging technologies can solve the world's problems. The winner of the competition will be profiled in Surface and would be eligible for an internship with the company at a later date. A cornerstone of the Surface Summer School of Penn is a public lecture series with leading designers, medical professions, and architects at the forefront of innovation. Upcoming speakers include Joe Desette, Marin Weiss, Mark Miller, and Jura Ben Chatri. Please see our website for the full schedule. Uh, tonight's lecture is given by Michael Rock, founder and creative director of 2x4 and a professor for nearly 30 years at RISD, Yale, Harvard, and currently at Columbia, where he focuses on the interplay between narrative and space. 2x4 is a multidisciplinary practice with studios in New York, Beijing, and their work bridges strategy, branding, and spatial experience design. They have a long history of collaborating with architects, including OMA, Dulles Cofidio Renfro, Herzog, and Demuron, Gary and Associates, Sana, and many others. Tonight, he'll be speaking on the topic and role of social Im imaginary, and by extension, brand identity, user experience, and style in mobilizing audiences, creating impactful experiences, and shaping the world. Projects discussed will include brand, ident brand identity and user experience for Nike, Prada, Apple, Lincoln Center, Target, and others. Welcome, Michael. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say tonight. Thanks, Mark and Winka, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm gonna put my screen up here and make sure everyone sees it. Okay, are we, you see the text now? Yes. Good. Okay. So um, I wanted to take a slightly different approach to this talk tonight because of the project you're doing and also thinking about it in sort of beyond the architectural or the, the construction aspect of the space and starting to think about the space as maybe as a brand, but even more as an imaginary. And so um, I'm going to talk tonight. I'm actually not going to show the projects Mark just mentioned. Um, I'm going to talk in a more general way about the way that we think about brand in general and the way that that I think infuses into all the ways that we um, we experience the world and uh, ultimately this can be worked back down and when you think about something like user experience or visitor journey because what you're creating ultimately is a sp an immersive space which uh, people enter into and it becomes a world that they inhabit and so we want to think about it in a very broad way so I start with this famous Joan Didion quote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And this idea that uh, if you think about the, the, the spheres that we move around in the world, there are always narrative in some ways. We're always entering into overlapping stories. So let me give you a very, um, oops, sorry, a very uh, simple um, metaphor to start off with. If you th imagine that you're looking into the night sky and in the chaos of stars, 
you begin to literally connect the dots. And at some point you get into a, a kind of story that's built on top of a totally chaotic situation. There's, there's no order or meaning to what you're seeing, but you create order by writing on top of that. And over a very long period of time, those stories start to become systematic. And uh, the, a lot of this talk is going to talk, be centered around this idea of systematic because we're talking right now about systematic racism and systematic sex, sexism. And I want to talk about that, that as a, a, a kind of imaginary that orders the world that we live in. So over time, this story that's created on top of the chaos becomes increasingly codified and then ultimately systematic in the sense that it turns into a kind of a series of um, operations and tools. So, you know, you can build a quasi science out of something which is totally imaginary. And then that has its own graphic language and its own um, representation somehow. And the more graphic it becomes, the more designed it becomes, the more real it becomes, because it has this uh, physical manifestation that can be manipulated in some way. And that's really the nature of the systematic, because the systematic is something which normalizes and makes something feel um, natural in a way, uh, even though it's basically a, a totally constructed. So the, it's that move from the emptiness of the sky and then us as humans writing onto that emptiness is the, the point that I want to look at in more detail. So I, I talk about this idea of designing the social imaginary. and. Um, to just to define some terms, when I think about designing, I think of that as this self-conscious act of creating self-evident and coherent identities, meaning that we very consciously are trying to create um, something which feels coherent when we design, almost always. It's very, very rarely that we design things to be incoherent. And, um, and so, but that's, that's obviously a very self-conscious act. We're trying to make that happen. And the the, I, I use Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher's definition here of the social imaginary. It, it, it's this way that, let's say, ordinary people, meaning they don't have to be specialists, imagine the world that they live in. And that's not in theoretical terms, maybe not in the terms we're talking about tonight, but in the images, the stories, and the legends, the things that basically are around them all the time. And how does that create a world for, for, for us as humans? So um, another really simple example, which is that you take this very... Um, beautiful piece of graphic design. And you could say, well, what does it mean? And um, of course, it's, it's the most minimal thing you can have, right? It's a piece of paper with black type on it stuck to a stick. But that stick and that sign is based on thousands of years of understanding about the idea of ownership, the idea of what a border is, the idea of uh, a law that could go and um, punish you if you transgressed it. All of these things are embedded in this, um, in this one really small piece of design. So we don't think about it at all, but we think, well, why is that property private? What does that mean to be private? Who owns it? What does it mean to own property? All of those things are basically assumptions which are covered in this very simple thing. So the design encapsulates all of those ideas and, uh, and in a way shields them from investigation, but also it communicates them in a really simple way. So when we think about something like this, we can go back to Hannah Arendt's famous you know, statement, which is, you know, the original sin is simple robbery. You know, at some point somebody just said, this is mine and it's not yours. And that was basically the act, that's the imaginary that happened. And then everything after that, all of the maps and the laws and the lines and the fences and the barbed wire and all of that reinforces that very basic jump that happened in the beginning, which was somebody just said, it's mine. And, um, and we tend to live in the world of barbed wire and maps and signs and things like that. And that's the world we manipulate as designers, but we rarely question the assumptions that are behind those things. And you can think about that in big ways um, in terms of these transformations of, you know, the, of the modern world, really the transformation of nature into thinking about property and exchange, thinking about money. Um, work into labor, these, these transformations that happen that abstract things and make them, you're able to design with them or manipulate them, but they're also abstractions from the thing that ultimately they came from. So, so let's um, look at that, and I'm going to look at that now in a, in a few different short chapters. So we'll start off with this idea of unnaturalism. So if we start here, which is kind of going back to degree zero, and say, everything that basically happened after that point is designed in some ways, right? So that that whole vast world that was filled was filled by people deciding to do something and making something. And that basically that 
that cluster of events becomes the world that we live in. But that, that world was entirely intentionally made by somebody. Somebody decided to do something and they did it. And so the world that we inhabit is not natural at all. It's always the world which is, is somehow conceived of as designed. And of course, that world can become increasingly embedded into other worlds and into other worlds. And so the, the world that we live in then becomes virtualized and it becomes another world and becomes another world. And so each one of those has its own uh, qualities and its own assumptions to it. But none of it is real or natural. All of it is a kind of artificial system that we live in. And Mark Wigley, uh, quote, you know, this planet's completely encrusted by this design as a geological layer that we call that Anthropocene, the idea of the crust on the earth, which is somehow uh, the result of our own work and that becomes the world that we live in. And we're familiar with that world in the sense that it's constantly telling us what to do. It's uh, directing us in some ways or maybe very specific ways in the sense that the world is designed to basically move you through it. And the world is designed to encase things that we might think of as natural um, by framing them or by reshaping them. Uh, you know, by we, we take things and we make them work for ourselves in different ways. Um, we selectively um, uh, reshape the things in the world so that they're more pleasing to us or we can use them in certain ways. We shape ourselves in ways that um, take us away from the natural and into something which is designed. We have all different kinds of techniques for doing that. And then even at the level of the chromosome in the sense that now we can design a gene so we can design all the way down to the level of changing the basic assumption of life as a designed act. So, so we can't really talk about the natural at all. We always talk about the designed and therefore the design has intention and therefore we have to always question that intention. So, so when I think about this constructing this imaginary world that we live in, I wanna use these three phrases that, um, that loosely based on Roberto Ungar's um, model. And Roberto Ungar is a legal theorist from Harvard um, but I think that his construct, construct, which he uses for law, actually works for design as well, which is that first, this idea of, of the formative context, which means that things that usually we have in our world start out basically as just routines or habits or customs. And slowly over time, over a very long period of time, they evolve into these, what seem to be now self-evident or institutionalized coherences. So meaning that at first things just start out because we do them a certain way. And when we do them a certain way enough, they start to become real for us and they seem to have a kind of permanence or a, a status. And ultimately that builds up to what Ungar calls false necessity, which is that they basically, those coherences become entrenched. You could also call this the systematic, right? Which is that these, these ideas or these differences become systematic or entrenched. And he uses this phrase, the idolatry of established institutions. Like we believe in them because they exist and they're hard to break because they've been around for a long time. And so when we talk about anything like, uh, like systematic racism, we talk about things which have developed over a long period of time and now seem to be naturalized somehow into the system. But the interesting thing about those is that they're actually very fragile. Uh, and he talks about this idea of negative capability. So that, that these institutions are open to resistance and recomposition. They just as strong as they seem, they can suddenly fall apart and be recomposed. And so we might call that process rebranding on one level or revolution on another level, but, um, but systems fall apart. And uh, they, at some point, they, uh, uh, the, the real becomes, you see the fragility of the real. I think oftentimes of this uh, title um, by the, the Russian um, writer, Alexei Yurchak, which is, um, everything was forever until it was no more, right? Like everything seemed like it was going, it was gonna always be forever and then suddenly it's no more. And I think that that's always the state of fragility, which is, you know, you design something that seems permanent and suddenly it changes. So let me use another example. So if I, um, in your class, asked a whole bunch of people to go and say like redesign uh, this clock, I'd get like a whole bunch of different designs that might um, suggest different ways of doing that. But I'd get very few that did that because as designers, we tend to reproduce the systems that were already in place for us and we change them somewhat, but we don't really fundamentally undermine them. We, we basically just rearrange the elements in certain ways. And so if you imagine a digital, a, a decimal timekeeping system, you'd have to rethink the way time works, not necessarily the clock itself. 
And there's no reason why this isn't just as good a way to depict time as the 12 hour version of it. It's just that the 12 hour version is our custom. And so that's like the formative context, right? Over time, it became you know, the custom that that's the way that we broke the time down. And then we keep repeating it over and over again until you have this idea of false necessity. Like it has to be that way because we've done it so often. But of course, it, it could change and it could become something different. And you can think about that in all different ways of thinking about um, systems that have structures to them, right? Like color, which is this undifferentiated experience, but is broken down through the diagram. Or something like as strange as this, where you, know, you can divide up belief systems through um, iconography. And, and again, when we get down to the idea of the systematic, as soon as you start to create the diagram, the diagram has this false necessity to it, which it seems like it's real somehow. And this is a famous diagram by Otto Neruth in um, the 30s and basically the kind of inventor of the um, icon. And, um, but already you can see the kind of systematic bias that's built into something like this, right? Which is that there's sort of one white guy and then everybody else is of color. There's sort of, everybody has this kind of um, typical year, except this guy who's the normative one, you know? So all of these things which seem kind of innocuous in something like this are actually embedded with all of these ideas that are um, part of the system. So, you know, we're, we're of course, uh, deep into the subject right now, right? Because this has become this big political discussion around this idea of what, what does this kind of division mean that's suggested by this design? And so you see a lot of this where basically the, the system that was seemed to be absolutely formative. It was basically the system that we live by suddenly is seen as very fragile. Like, why do you have this division? What does it mean? And of course that system has an architecture to it, right? Because it's not just an icon, it's a door. And the fact that there are two doors are meaningful, right? Because you have, you're confronted by making a choice between this binary choice between two doors. So you have an architectural confrontation that makes you have a decision between these two things. So it's not just the two icons, but it's the two doors. And over time, of course, th those divisions, which again, started off in very um, blurry and not particularly formed way, the idea that women and men should have separate bathrooms sort of formed in, in, a, in a very casual way. But now that's part of building code and that becomes legal. And in fact, you can be prosecuted if you don't follow that rule. And so that thing that started off as a custom becomes embedded into something like code in a way that makes us reproduce it over and over again. So that, you know, that unless you transgress the code, you have to reproduce the binary system that was formed in this totally arbitrary way in the first place. But it's important to remember again, when you're thinking about the systematic that at one time in America, there weren't two doors, there were three doors. And basically that confrontation again about which door you chose, again, is an architectural um, embodiment or manifestation of the systematic, right? That the systematic racism here is built into the architecture itself. It forces you to make a choice. And by having the door, it seems like these categories are somehow real. Like how can they not be real if you have a door already? The door embodies the realness of the category. So, you know, when you're dealing with that idea of systematic, of course, anything can be created um, to, uh, to create difference. It doesn't, it, there's no reason it has to be one thing or another. The, you can use gender, you can use other ways to create those differences. But the fact is that architecture and design reinforces those differences all the time. So, um, Noah Harari talks about this idea that something like identity is always problematic because at some point, sooner or later, the fictional aspect is going to be collide with reality, or you might say collide with another fiction, right? That, that we're, we've lived in that fiction of having men's and women's divisions and two doors for so long that it seems impossible to overturn where suddenly it overturns, right? It's so you, you move from one system to another. And of course, we're surrounded by these systems all the time in the sense of you're constantly confronted with these choices, which are graphic choices or architectural choices. So these are just like doors, right? That you have to make a choice here and say like, how am I gonna define myself? And in fact, you know, how, how is this thing which is held and called out different from all of these things somehow? And so the fact that there's a checkbox means that the category is meaningful to us somehow. And, you know, we're surrounded by, um, by systems like that all the time, which are just so familiar to us. And so it's the way we break down the world. This is our imaginary. We break down the world between animals and plants and between, in the, between animals, between the protozoa and the metazoa. These become 
systems that are laid over the world. But you know, Foucault in uh, his famous chapter in The Order of Things referred to um, uh, Borges essay, Borges referred to this kind of imaginary Chinese encyclopedia he found where the, um, he talks about this, the, the animals being organized through these categories. And it basically is saying that it's impossible to imagine if you're in one system, another system and how it works, right? That you're so embedded in one system, you can't imagine the mind that would organize something using these categories. Um, and there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. So anything can become systematic. Right? You can make, basically break down the world into any set of categories. But Foucault talks about that it, the stark impossibility of thinking that, that, it's, it, that as a, a human in one system, it's almost impossible to break your mind out of that system and to think uh, through another one. The systematic is so strong after a while until it falls apart. So let's look at that from a, se a second way. So, um, uh, John Thompson talks about, again, the, the, thinking about the social imaginary, that um, the social imaginary is this, this, this dimension through which we create the ways that we live together. And it's the ways that we represent our collective life, right? So it's not only how we live, but it's how we show how we live. And in that way, it really relates to what we do, for instance, as designers, because we make images of things. So the kinds of images we make are meaningful. And this, again, is the way that things become systematic. So let's look at a really basic example, which is that this is a map drawn in um, 1704. It's um, uh, Charleston, uh, Carolina, and it uh, basically was drawn by the colonial government to show the area that had been settled, so it's called settled, and then who owned the different parcels of the land within the, the embattlement wall here that goes around it. And then at the same time, the colonial governor commissioned a map with the native peoples who lived in the same vicinity to draw a map of their um, area. So it's basically the same piece of landscape or real estate. Um, and then it was drawn on a deer hide. And then this is the settlement town. And then this is all of the relationships of the different tribal people who lived in that um, zone and drawn. Uh, so you have basically these two depictions of the same piece of land. And so you ask yourself, well, which one is the correct one? Which one shows the world correctly? And of course, you have to say both or neither. But what's more important is that they tell us something because they, this is the way of uh, uh, representing our collective life together. So if you think about what this map shows you, everything is inside, right? It's all inside the wall. It's all within protection. Everything's about um, security, right? You're inside the river. You're inside this piece of land. Everything outside of it is just forgotten. And it's all about ownership, right? The, how the land is broken up. And here you have this zone, which is a series of soft relationships, interconnected pieces, um, and with a, with a kind of loose relationship to all the different parts. So, so you can start to then imagine that these are totally different ways of imagining the world, totally different ways of imagining the place that you're living, totally different ways of imagining the community that you're part of. And that that different way of thinking about these spaces are communicated through uh, a graphic depiction, right? The graphic depiction reveals something which is in the way, in our character, in the way that we think. So um, uh, John Harley talks about this idea that maps created empire. And why, ma why do maps create empire? Because they're basically effective for pacification, civilization, exploitation of territories that are, can be imagined but not yet claimed, right? So you can basically draw a map and claim something even if you've never been there. Right? So the map is a way to claim territory or to settle it or to protect it because you, you in graphic form or in architectural form, you lay order onto something and then basically you claim ownership again, going back to a rent. It starts off with a simple robbery, right? Like we simply say, this is ours. And we, the way we say that as ours is we draw a line around it. And so the line itself becomes the depiction of the imaginary. The, Foucault also talks about this idea that all maps are military, right? The, as soon as you draw a line, you can have a war. Until you have draw the line, you can't have one. You have to go and say like, this is mine and that's yours. And you have to depict that somehow. And that distinction is meaningful. So um, another way to think about that, if you think about the line as being one of them, the word or the name is also another way of doing that. And um, 
Mark Wigley again, uh, at a lecture we did together one time, asked this question, is the Atlantic Ocean graph a design? Which is, if you know Mark, kind of typical Mark question, but an absurd question. Except what he says is that, you know, if you think about something which has no border or edge to it, it's undefinable. But when you start to map it and you start to draw it, and you start to draw edges, both the European edge, and then you start to draw this other edge to it, and you start to depict it into part of a world system. Again, it becomes systematic. And then you give it a name, and the name starts to say, this thing is meaningful somehow, and this thing is different from the thing below it and the thing next to it. The name itself contains those things. And so the, the systematic is a way of slowly giving more and more definition to something to make it inevitable. So where you draw, you draw it, you name it, you mark it, you measure it, you look at it in section, you look at it in, um, in plan, you start to basically own it through its depictions. And then slowly that becomes a way of making something real or meaningful. So just calling something by declaring it something, it's a way of establishing a fact, right? So the fact that we say this now is the Atlantic Ocean establishes that as a thing which did, didn't exist before, but the name itself becomes a kind of border around it. The name, this declaration becomes a way of creating a new reality where there was nothing before. So the fact that you're, um, you, that by simply putting a name on something, by simply drawing a line around it, you start to create an imaginary. And Nelson Goodman talks about this idea, which are, these are distinctions that aren't found in the world. These aren't like real distinctions, but they're built into worlds. So it's the distinctions that we make as designers that start to create those, um, those meanings. So let me give you an, even a, a stupider example. But um, if we start off with this idea of the social imaginary is this understanding, it's a common understanding, that once you have that common understanding, it makes it, it possible to have common practices and um, a sense of legitimacy because you all share the same idea and therefore what you do is becomes legitimate. So if we take a really simple example, here you have a piece of land in the western part of the United States. At a certain point, four, four straight lines were drawn on a map. And those four straight lines now create an imaginary. So it's, it's the simplest act. It's just a thin line that's drawn on a map. And now we can talk, and then we give it a name, right? So we've created a declaration and we give it a name. Now this is a thing that we can deal with. It's a social fact. And it, it's interesting that the slogan of that first US land survey that was surveying the West was order upon the land, right? We're laying order somehow on this space. Once you've drawn that line, now you can start designing, right? So you can start to define that edge more. You can say that line is here. You can't see it, but this is where it is. And you can say, these are, uh, th this is um, a, a representation of who we are, livestock, mines, grain, oil. This is our flag. This is our um, motto. Um, this is the way we depict ourselves. This is our architecture, and this represents us in some ways. Um, we have a character and a people. Um, we have a people that were displaced and are no longer part of that story, right? That now, that now have to be excised from the story to make this new story be real. And then we can say that there, once you have that name, you can have, you can say now these are Wyoming's, right? That that basically we we can create this whole group of people who didn't exist before because we have this thing who can start to feel identified to this thing, which again is imaginary. They can have leaders. They can have strange activities and all these strange customs. And so all of those are built up because of those four lines that were drawn on the map. And that gives it legitimacy. And then you can start to believe it is real and you can start to design around it. And you can start to say, this doesn't fit this character or this does, even though the character of that is something that's manufactured in the first place. So it's a way of kind of creating a whole world out of all this design things and that people actually connect to and feel part of even though it's basically a, a totally constructed event. So Goodman again talks about this idea of what design provides is plausible self-evidence. Like there must be a state there, there must be a line because I see the sign, there must be a government because I see the building, there must be uh, you know, this thing happening because I see all the people together. So these are all the, the plausible self-evidence, like of course it is, I can see the product of it, therefore the thing must exist. So the next part of this talk that I'm going to go into more of the tactical parts of like, how do we go and create those, uh, those um, imaginaries. So the first most basic one is uniformalism, basically just making things look alike makes them a part of the same thing, right? And you're all familiar with that, which is that, and it's not different from that picture here, which is just if everyone wears yellow and brown, then they're part of the system, right? And so here, 
just making something the same makes it part of the system. And that's, that's a really important thing because we have to say that things have to be the same. Otherwise, we don't realize that they're all part of the, um, the, the network that they're connected to. But of course, again, like the, the private property sign, this simple red light, which is the same almost everywhere you go, has behind it a whole network of meanings, right? Which is that if I don't obey it, I'll probably get stopped. I might get lose my license. I might get a ticket. All of these things are implied in this really simple form, but it's important that the form's always the same wherever you go. And that's important when you think about branding, like, you know, if, um, if you think about New York Times or something like that, every day you get the New York Times, it looks like the New York Times, basically. It has variation within it, but it has only enough variation that it doesn't go and break the, the sameness, right? The, the, the system works because it's enough the same every time to make you feel that it's real. And of course, that idea of the uniform, the way of basically bringing things together, of creating um, unity out of, um, through the, through the graphic or the visual, and also in the way that there's a kind of elimination of identity through, through uniformity, uh, uniformity too. In the sense like here, the fact that all of the humanity or the individual um, identity of the, uh, of the individuals is erased in favor of the uniform and the uniformity of the, of the image, right? So the force becomes important where the individual gets lost. And of course that it can do, be done in benign ways and in um, uh, also in the sense of how do you become part of something simply by putting on a shirt or you become part of something by simply, uh, you know, being like everyone else. Or, you know, this example in the March in 2017, by simply knitting a hat and wearing a pink hat, you become part of something, right? It's just the uniformism of basically um, color that allows you to be um, part of that system. But of course, that, that again is systematic, right? Color is systematic. Color is a, a, a system that, um, that divides and, and creates a meaning somehow. So when we talk, talk about systematic gender, you have you know, blue and pink become categories that you have to fit into, right? Then you have to go and somehow um, uh, slot everyone into one of these, uh, these colors. And in, in the bigger way, the way that uniformity over time creates normalization, right? So if you watch television in the America in the 50s, 60s, this would be the depiction of America that you would see. It was totally uniform and therefore it seemed normal. Like this was the normal way of looking at the world. And this was basically what, um, what we would think was the, the way the, the nation looked or something. And what's interesting about Theaster Gates, the artist project called the Black Image Corporation, is that he collected the archive from the Johnson Publishing Company, which is the, uh, the company that produces Ebony and Jet. And they have this thousands and thousands of images of black life at that same period, a kind of stock photos of black life that depicts a totally alternative world that's just basically invisible, that was erased in that depiction of America. And so basically um, his project to kind of to resurrect this alternative or this parallel um, view of uh, black culture at the time, which was basically eclipsed by the systematic aspect of white culture, that it basically disappears in the system. Um, it, and Theaster talks about this idea, we never had the luxury of being imaged in proliferation. And the idea of being imaged in proliferation, I think is really interesting that just, the, just seeing the same thing over and over again makes it somehow real or normative or systematic. And, and it, to a certain point, it becomes invisible to us until finally your eyes are open and you realize the thing that you've been looking at for so long um, doesn't make sense or is unmeaningful. And it's worth noting that it wasn't until 2015 that Apple and um, iOS 8.3 basically diversified its depiction of, you know, even a simple thing like this thumb you know, again, this normative view of the world that, that was only five years ago that basically that um, that is so deeply embedded into everyone's life, you know, didn't had it had no representation of difference in it. So if that one aspect of it is, you know, looking at this idea of uniformity and then um, the next is thinking about this notion of style. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. One of these things 
doesn't belong Can you tell which thing is not like the other Before I finish my song So basically I tell everyone that's all you need to know about design That basically um, design is about creating things that are alike and things that are different And the way that oftentimes that alikeness and difference is done is through style And style is a strange thing because oftentimes it's difficult to talk about but you know, we're used to style all the time as being one of the things that make um, objects cohere for us. And so if you think about that, these items, designed items, all seem like a set, and these items all seem like a set. They do the exact same thing. There's no functional difference between them, but there's a stylistic difference. And that stylistic difference is meaningful because it allows us to go and put them into a, a, an order somehow or to understand it. Because ultimately that, you know, we're thinking about the world is an aesthetic phenomena, right? That you live in a world of aesthetic differences and those differences take on meaning. And that meaning can be really manufactured meaning or it can be um, found meaning. But here, the interesting example, again, two objects that do exactly the same thing, but the style somehow genders them, right? They become different because of the way that they're styled, not because of how they work, but because that we've imposed a, a gendered style onto them. And when you're a designer, you're always basically framed or um, controlled by style to a certain extent. So if you are a designer for Porsche and you're designing this car, you have to design it with this car, even though it's 40 years before it, in mind somehow. Because to stay within the Porsche brand, there has to be enough stylistic relationship between the two that you see them as coherent, that there's not, it's not a radical departure from one to the other. And we think about that in, as fashion also. Right? This, this is 30 years of work by Mitra Prada. And, so she can have wild experimentation within her work, but somehow all of it stays together. There's a kind of coherent quality stylistically that's, that's alike enough to see it as one body of work. And of course, style has meaning too. There's a sign in China for a coffee shop, you know, which is that we recognize certainly the style of something, even though if the, if the content doesn't actually fit to it. And you can think about style in lots of interesting ways. So like this is all covers from Penguin books and all of the, um, all of the novels are about different things and radically different things. But the style is something that ties them together as the product of, uh, of the corporation, right? The corporation is the thing that, that puts them out. And so you have the tension between the individual author and the individual story and the style of the corporation. And so that gets us into this whole idea of the search term, because the search term is a way of, um, of identifying style. So for instance, if I do a search on Google images for Donna and child, I'll get, you know, 100 million images or something like that. And they're all basically the same content, but stylistically they have this variation. And so I could say that between these three versions of that stylistically, I can learn something about either the culture it comes from or the time period it came from or the technique of, that was created. So it's not about the story itself, but it's about basically something on top of that that tells that, that we're getting information from. If I do the same thing and I search for Russian constructivism, I'll get like a whole bunch of things that look like this. And some of them might be 1905 posters for Battleship Potemkin, but some might be uh, you know, a fashion ad for arm yourself with a slouchy bag or here a Stolik Noya ad. So I, I recognize the style of these things that creates a category even though they might be different. And you can do that in all different ways. I can look for Swiss design or I can look for one specific designer. And all of those ways, the search term itself is a way of defining the world. And um, Goodman talks about this idea that, it, again, we can only think within the structure of our searches. So basically it takes very it's very difficult for us to perceive anything outside of the search that we've already created for it. That becomes the category by which we understand it. So you know, can, we can extend that out to all different kinds of things because if we're talking about the systematic and about creating um, the edges of things by bordering things, by keeping things in and out, you know, of course the wall is the most brutal form of that in the sense that it takes the invisible line that's drawn on the landscape and it gives it architectural heft. So the wall itself becomes the manifestation of something which is telling you what's inside and what's outside, where order lives and where disorder is and, and how do we use coherence in architecture and coherence in urbanism to create that sense of inside and outside. But of course, you know, a border can have all different qualities. This is the border between Holland and uh, Brussels uh, where it runs kind of through the restaurant or across the street. So a very soft kind of border 
identifying it, the, the line on the map is identified in the real world at 100% scale, but in a, in a soft way, you know, again, between Norway and Sweden. And then, uh, you know, in uh, less conflicted borders, more defined, so here between Canada and US, again, the, the border, which is an imaginary, has starts to have an architecture to it, right? To say, here lies the border and this is meaningful. This division is meaningful to us somehow. And we have to give it um, structure. And there could be all different kinds of um, uh, walls, right? Because in you know, certain Orthodox communities, you can, string wire and create an inside space which allows you to lift things during the sabbath which you might not if you're outside of that community have any idea that that wall exists at all or that border exists but it exists because you're part of the the understanding the community that understands and accepts that wall and of course again it's systematic the wall the wall can be um uh, physical but it also can be uh, systematic in the sense that it creates divisions, um, which again forces uh, choice. And it can be economic too. So this is not Photoshop, a real um, wall in South Africa, it's two different neighborhoods, two total different imaginaries, right, separated by a wall. So you have this, um, the, the physical, the architectural division creating two imaginaries, um, which are entirely separate from each other. So, you know, one of the most interesting things is when you can see something happen in real time. And so, uh, you know, if we look at the wall in Berlin, uh, you know, in 1961, um, Walter Ulbricht announced that, you know, no one has the intention of erecting a wall uh, in June of uh, 1961. And then two months later, a wall appeared, right? So that wall is, you know, the, again, the most brutal full, brutal manifestation of creating two new imaginaries where there once was one. So the city suddenly becomes literally divided and the wall becomes a way of um, articulating that. And so the, the what was once one coherent city becomes two cities and the wall itself, the physical thing, the bricks and mortar and barbed wire becomes a manifestation of a metaphor, that, an earlier metaphor. So the Iron Curtain was a metaphor that Churchill adopted, it actually has earlier origin to it, but Churchill kind of made it famous and um, first in um, 12th of May, 1945. So the Iron Curtain became, was a metaphor that the, the Berlin Wall became the physicalization of the metaphor. So the metaphor becomes realized in the wall. And once you have this division and the wall becomes a, a kind of physical separation the two imaginaries then develop on their own because all like with the Wyoming case, the wall allows other divisions to happen. So now we can have two new iconographies, right? There can be flags for both sides and seals for both sides, and you can have soccer teams for both sides, right? So now the, these all are the things that build the imaginary to give it meaning that there's a difference between the, uh, between the two. But again, going back to your check, um, you know, he talks about this idea that, uh, when he uses the phrase hypernormalization, that everyone knew the fakeness was um, was the, knew the fakeness was accepted, um, and everyone ex accepted it. Basically, it was going to fall out at some point. But basically, you lived in that imaginary because you didn't have any other choice, right? The imaginary was the world that you were given. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So Reagan making this big statement at the Berlin Wall, you know, to kind of somehow reunite, which then ultimately did months later um, end, end with a uh, reuniting and with the removal of the wall. And then, of course, now you can have a unified soccer team again. So, you, you know, the, the, the physicalization of the um, wall taken down now becomes a unity that can be re-expressed. But that, that aspect of the architecturalization of that division of spaces, so here the one in Palestine, you know, is something that basically is uh, everyday occurrence in our lives that we see private property, physical borders, political divisions manifest in architectural divisions. Build that wall, build that wall, build that wall, build that wall. So you wonder, you know, what's the obsession um, with this idea, but it's exactly that aspect, which is that how do you create the imagine, how do you make the imaginary more real? So if the border is imaginary, if it's a line that we've drawn on a map, do you, by creating architecture around it, by adding structure to it, it becomes more real, it becomes manifest. The, the formative context becomes supported by that. 
So until the wall falls and suddenly flows down, again, that's the idea of um, negative capability, that that wall, which seems so inevitable, suddenly falls down and it's not there anymore, just overnight. Um, you know, up, up to that point, you can build it and make it stronger and stronger and stronger in the same way that you make the imaginary stronger and stronger. And then all the ways that, you know, session with the border by the idea of oh, yeah. So Zizek talks about this imaginary cartography and it projects onto the real landscape its own um, shadowy ideological antagonism. So, you know, that there's uh, underneath all of this stuff uh, this this cartography that's giving rise to all the things that we're designing all the time. So just like the clock, we're kind of always just redesigning the things that are there already, but not really transgressing them or changing them. So the last chapter then, um, you know, I talk about specifically about branding because, and this is probably related to your project too, because you have to think about not just a space, but how people understand it and what it's thought about. So, you know, brand originally is this idea of how do you create products which are different from each other, right? So if you're going to have you know thousands of products in a store, you had to be able to tell them apart really simply. And so brands create difference between things which might not be so different. And as an example of that, um, you have uh, the um, you know thousands of products that you're familiar with that all have their own brands are really the product of about eight different companies, right? So these companies produce all of these things which have difference to them because the, the difference is designed into them to make the, the world you live in full of objects which are, create, are choices. So, you know, in general, you have a whole bunch of things like that that are the products of all the same company, but they're differentiated again through style, through color, to feel that they're somehow, um, they're autonomous, that they have their own quality, partially because people feel uncomfortable that their toothpaste and their dog food are made by the same company, but the, um, that you have this idea of difference and that difference is meaningful to us. So, you know, here you have two products from the same company which do the same thing, but are, are kind of autonomous because of the way that they're designed. They're designed to be autonomous. So, you know, an example of that is um, the, uh, back in the 70s, there was a famous case where one of those, one of those big eight companies was called Beatrice, and it decided at a certain point that at the end of all of its commercials for all its products, it would come on with this little weird spooky thing that said, we're Beatrice. And it freaked everyone out because like suddenly it revealed, it pulled back the curtain and revealed the, the systematic behind this thing, which seemingly these autonomous units were um, products of. And it was a total failure and actually Beatrice ultimately broke up after that. But um, you know, when, when you think as a brander, you're always thinking about products or things or companies or people really in these differential systems and how they're different. So if you're looking at the gap, you're saying, how's the gap not like Banana Republic or Old Navy, that it's somehow, it's in this um, system of relationships and that you're finding a space for it, which is differentiated in some way. And we, we can see that again in real time change where at one time you had two things which are differentiated when United and Continental were separate. And then at some point they just squeeze together and become one thing. So after years of working to be different, they become the same. Corporations are people, my friend. And another way of thinking about that idea, of, you know, that Romney talks about this idea of corporations of people, which, you know, Hello, I'm a Mac. Hello, I'm a PC. We have a lot in common these days. Uh, we, we both, both run, run a Microsoft, Microsoft office. office. So this, this famous campaign, you know, which tended to go and say like, we can embody all of the qualities of a brand in the physical body of a figure, right? That, and people start talking about this idea of brand DNA. The brand like literally has a biology to it that's separate. And that we can create these separations between those things. And those can be designed and manipulated to create meaning. And so going back to Unger, thinking about that idolatry of established institutions, after a while, we really start to believe those distinctions because they've been so um, expertly crafted for us. And those distinctions are the way that we think of ourselves, like I'm a Mac person or I'm a PC person. And now I've started to use that division to go and think about the way that I think about myself or the way that I think about my friends or, you know, that you start to use these things like I wear Gucci, but I don't wear Prada or I wear Chanel and I don't wear Gucci become these ways of starting to identify yourself in the way that maybe a religion would in the past. 
and again, what's always interesting is if you can see this process happening in real time. And so what we've seen recently is the attempt to coalesce a brand around Europe and um, against the idea of a mosaic uh, Europe, you know, of all these different um, meanings and countries or, or cultures to see Europe as a, as a meaningful brand, as meaningful unity. And so all of the devices to do that are kind of superimposed, but a process that would usually take thousands of years is trying to be pushed through in you know, a, a couple decades. And so you create a flag and you create money and you create these different depictions here, cool houses, um, you know, uh, barcode Europe of taking all the flags and making sort of one unified message out of it. But what we are witnessing is that that's a really fragile system and the attempt to try to go and create the brand around it is actually um, difficult. So, you know, we're, we're seeing right now the fact that um, part of the system is falling apart, right? Brexit is a breakdown of that system. The unity that was attempted to be created is actually doesn't hold. And so I was looking in an interesting way about this thing called Eurolab, which is a presentation by Coolhouse and uh, Wolfgang Tillmans and uh, Stefan Peterman. And um, the Eurolab was this attempt to, in the face of Brexit, to try to create a, a advertising campaign around that that solidified the meaning of Europe as a, as a nation, as a country. And so they created all of these posters and these images and, um, and different ways to try to go and boost the, um, the presence of Europe for its own people. Interestingly, it's all in English, which is the one country which has departed. Um, but it, but it, if you read the, the manifesto for Eurolab, it's interesting because they, they talk about rebranding the EU and um, how can we can, co can cooperation and solidarity be communicated to a large audience in a fresh and compelling way? How can the European Union be valued and recognized for its citizens as a force for good rather than a faceless bureaucracy? So really trying to change the identity of Europe through its representation. Again, thinking about the community is through its representation. And more interesting, I think, is that um, in their statement, they say, um, we're convinced that today's Europe is best there ever was and that the European project should be protected in these unstable times. And I think this word protected is so fascinating because again, thinking about that negative capability, the fragility of established institutions, that um, it need, it's not something which is self-evident. It needs actually to be nurtured and protected to hold it together somehow. And that in this very self-conscious way to try to, um, to create the, use the brand to create the nation. So, um, you know, they ended up basically the product of that was t-shirts and uh, slogans. And, um, but I think that the problem with that whole project is that Benedict Anderson in his fantastic book called Imagine Communities talks about unselfconscious coherence and that unselfconscious is really important because as soon as you become conscious of the coherence, it becomes artificial and coherence is, that is unselfconscious feels natural and systematic. Um, and self-conscious coherence feels artificial. And so the, the act around Europe is a, is a very self-conscious kind of um, coherence. So finally, um, just in conclusion, uh, so if we go back to say the social imaginary is predi predicated on shared belief as a community, we have to believe something and that, those, that belief has um, all different kinds of qualities to it. And that's reinforced by this idea of physicality and visualization. In other words, that the things that we make as designers are the evidence for that, that um, shared belief, that we, we build the things that make things feel unified. And therefore design, we're constructing that evidence, right? We're the, the part of it. So if we go back to these guys, um, it was interesting because in the Times a little while ago, there was this, uh, they were talking about that California passed a law that had this said, guaranteed students the right to use any bathroom facility they wanted to. And this Re Republican congressman withdrew his child from the school and he said, it's as if our public schools have stopped being public schools and they're now government indoctrination centers. And what I thought was interesting about that was there's no design which is not indoctrinating, right? All design indoctrinates because all design represents endlessly reproduces the distinctions by which we order our world. So no matter what you design, it's an indoctrinating force because it's making people think that the thing somehow is real or normal. So when we talk about systematic anything, design is the system. When we talk about systematic racism, systematic gender, uh, gender discrimination, any of those things, we're talking about a system which is designed somehow and is designed by all of us. So I'd say design always depicts and manifests the things that matter to us until they don't.
nasty end.